So I want to welcome everybody to this weekly seminar series for the Center of Excellence in Biodiversity and Natural Resource Management. And I'm going to turn my video on briefly just to give you the introduction, and then I'm, I'll turn it back off. Um, we have this weekly seminar series in order to um, have an opportunity to come together and talk about what projects are going on, both in Rwanda, but also globally, and just to share um, information and knowledge. And we like to be informal, so we always welcome people to, um, to propose a talk. If you have um, something you want to present to the group, um, either finished research or research concept, we welcome you and you can contact Daniel. He is the one that organizes these uh, seminars. And also, if you want to be on our emailing list, you can put your name and email address in the chat room. So today, I'm really, really excited to invite Tammy Matson here and welcome her to give a talk today. Um, she was telling me that she was concerned about talking since her study isn't done. And I said, well, that makes it more interesting. And then we're going to have her come back and talk about the study at the end and find out um, what has changed and what new information. But right now, um, it's just such an interesting topic. And um, during this time of um, pandemic and lockdown and things going on in the world, what better thing can we talk about than elephants? So um, we're going to welcome Tammy, and she um, has been doing research with um, elephants in Akagera National Park for um, a, a couple of years now, and she's been working with um, students at University of Rwanda and helping to build research capacity and contributing to uh, community conservation in the area as well. And she works closely with um, the park uh, authority and management as well. And she also um, is a tour guide, uh, has her own tour company. And so it's also for us really interesting to hear about the linkage between tourism and wildlife conservation, because we know it's a really important issue here in Rwanda. So um, uh, with that, I wanna invite you to um, take over the screen, Tammy, and welcome you to talk to us about your work. Thank you so much. Thanks, Beth. I'll see if I can make this work. Let's give this a go. Okay, just pulling up my PowerPoint. Can you see that there? Yes, it's okay. coming. That's yes. fantastic. Okay. You're all right, you've got that opening page there? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, well, I mean, yes, what an amazing um, amazing time we're living in. And I, as Beth said, I was a little nervous about uh, presenting uh, results this early um, and also because it's been about a year since I've been back in Akigera. Obviously, with COVID, um, I'm stuck in Australia. Uh, I'm a long way from, from the elephants at the moment. It's probably going to be another year before I can get back out uh, to Rwanda because of the uh, government restrictions on travel. Uh, in Australia, so uh, I'm really missing Rwanda and uh, the people that I work with over there and uh, Akagera, of course. So really these results that I'm presenting today are very preliminary and we're very in the in the early stages of, of gathering information and learning about the population in Akagera. Uh, but it's been an interesting journey so far and um, I, I guess to start, um, I'll just give you a little bit of background. I, I actually didn't start working on elephants. Uh, I began my uh, research career working on black-faced impalas uh, in Namibia. It's a, a vulnerable species of impala that's only found in the arid zone in southwest Africa. Um, I spent a lot of time working on them, working on their habitat use uh, and their conservation and planning reintroductions to their historic range where they've been poached out. I eventually wrote their management plan. Um, during those years, I also worked in the safaris as an environmental consultant and learned a lot about the link between tourism and community-based conservation, working closely with Indigenous communities in Namibia. Um, and I guess that was my first foray into tourism and seeing how tourism could benefit uh, conservation. I then went on to work on human-elephant conflict, uh, starting working with the, uh, the, the Bushmen in Nine Eye Conservancy in Namibia, and later on, I ended up working for WWF in Australia, uh, taking on a, a, a more of a, a threatened species conservation role there. 
and that led into work uh, further, further on my career working on ivory trade uh, when we moved to Singapore. Um, back in, I think it was 2012, 2013, around then when we were living in Singapore, the ivory trade was becoming a really big issue. And uh, I was living in Asia at the time, which is where a lot of the ivory was being traded and sent to from perched elephants in Africa. So I ended up working a lot more in running a campaign there to try and convince people in Asia not to buy Africa's ivory. Um, but I guess all of these things sort of came together eventually when I decided to uh, develop my own uh, safari company. And I did that because some of the best conservation work that I had seen in uh, southern Africa uh, was through, uh, um, through tourism and seeing the large-scale habitat conservation that you could achieve um, and the community benefits that flow back from tourism when it was done um, right. So that's why I developed um, Mats and Lulu Safaris. And we've been going for about seven years. Um, pretty hard times at the moment uh, for everybody in tourism, but we're, we're soldiering on. But just to give you a little bit of background about elephants, many of you will know this already, but until recently we didn't even have a, a, an estimate of population size of elephants across Africa. Um, the Great Elephant Census was conducted a few years ago and it demonstrated a decline of about 30% of the elephants in Africa between 2007 and 2014. And that was, I think, worse than a lot of people expected. And surprising also that some of the worst affected uh, areas for elephants were in countries that you wouldn't expect, like um, uh, Tanzania, um, parts of southern Zambia, uh, certain parts of Zimbabwe were also being affected by, by the poaching. Um, I don't believe this has been updated since then, so I'm just presenting some, some general information. But the main threats to elephants today tend to be habitat loss, poaching for the illegal trade and human-elephant conflict. And I just threw this photograph in because I thought you might be interested. This is a photograph I took in Bangkok a few years ago in Thailand showing how ivory from elephants is transformed into very beautiful jewellery in Asia. And this was ivory that was freely available uh, at markets and you could walk into the market. I took this photograph myself and I just said, you know, what have you got for sale? And here it was, ivory for sale. Um, since then, there's been massive awareness campaigns and the laws have actually changed in Thailand and in many other parts of Asia to stop people buying ivory. But uh, back then, and this is only sort of, I guess, six or seven years ago, people actually didn't realise that to to uh, buy ivory like this, uh, you had to kill the elephant. Uh, and that it, a lot of people in Asia actually thought that the tusks of the elephant just dropped out. So um, it was quite a fascinating journey learning about motivations and, and how to change people's behaviour in relation to, to buying something like ivory. And so part of what we did there was I worked closely with a, uh, a celebrity, a TV star in Asia who was very well known, Nadia Butkalong, and that's her up in the top right corner. And we made a documentary which then went across uh, Asia on National Geographic Channel, basically educating people about ivory and the link between uh, that beautiful jewellery that you might buy uh, at the market and the elephants that were being killed in Africa to provide it. And I think we've played a small role in helping to change people's uh, con consumption habits. This was another um, uh, advertising campaign that we supported with some of the funds that we raised from, uh, from that campaign. Uh, and that was with the, the Thai uh, soccer team who, uh, who became ambassadors for stopping uh, the ivory trade with a group called Wild Aid, and we uh, we supported that campaign. So for me, I think it's all been it's always been about connecting people to nature, and one of the most powerful ways, and, and I, I still think one of the best ways we can do that is by actually taking people to Africa and connecting them, and showing them the amazing environment that Africa provides. Um, this is a, one of my first groups to uh, Rwanda, and uh, that's up uh, trekking with the gorillas up in the Rwandas, and uh, that was the first time that I actually took a tour group to, to Rwanda, and it really opened my eyes, and it was the first chance that I had also to go and have a look at Akagera. Um, I was interested in Akagera because I knew African Parks, and African Parks is in a joint uh, partnership with the Rwandan Development Board, uh, and together they run Akagera National Park. And I know that wherever African Parks works, they have huge success in uh, changing um, uh, the game, you know, the reduced poaching, they bring huge community benefits. 
and we see wildlife populations go up. So I wanted to see for myself, and um, so I ventured over to Apigera, and that's where I met the team, and, and we started discussing the idea of potentially combining my tourism um, safaris uh, with an elephant research project where my, my clients could participate, but also uh, help fund the, the research itself. And that's something that I wanted to do for, for quite a long time. So Apigera, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure many of you have been there, uh, it's, it's a, a great success story in, in conservation. Um, it's a place that has so many different habitats, great lakes, beautiful mountains. It's on the border with uh, Tanzania, but it also has these gorgeous big open savannas. It now has uh, black rhinos in addition to a, a multiplying lion population. And the elephant population is uh, doing, doing very well too and has grown a lot since, since they were reintroduced. Um, and it's managed by the Apigera Management Corporation, which is this lovely combination of the, of the NGO, African Parks, and the Rwandan government working together and really showing, um, showing the rest of the world how great conservation can be done. Um, African Parks, uh, this is just a, a brief spiel on, on who they are. I'm sure you're familiar with them. But they work in areas that are, are not always well known uh, on the safari trail, uh, I guess, um, places that might be a little bit forgotten uh, and that they can come in and, and bring in serious on-ground uh, training and um, working with local communities and with government. It's an absolute game changer where they come in uh, with their ranger programs. Uh, and we've seen that even this year you know, with COVID. Uh, in Apigera, I've, I've just heard today that you know that, that, that the the park Apigera is still supporting uh, the ranger work. They're continuing to pay the salaries of their staff there, which is just amazing. Uh, where in other places where perhaps the African parks hasn't, uh, or, or there isn't a, an operation like this going on, uh, and they're more reliant on tourism income, it can be a lot more difficult when uh, the tourism uh, funding uh, dries up. So Apigera is. Uh, from, from all reports, is doing really well. Um, so I, I set up the Apigera Elephant Project working closely with, uh, with guidance from the Apigera Man Management Company with the staff on the ground uh, back in 2018. And um, this was one of the first elephants that, that we met in the park. She's quite a character. I'll, I'll tell you more about her soon. But she's also she's one we originally called um, Floppy Ears because her ears permanently uh, flop forward uh, for some reason. Um, she's one of the older females at the park, but she's very recognisable and uh, obviously she was one of the first ones that we identified as part of the, the project. So the Akigera elephants uh, came back to Akigera in 1975, not naturally, but uh, they were translocated there following a cull of 182 elephants in the Lucera region in another part of Rwanda. There was only 26 of them that were reintroduced, and they were all very young, under the age of 10. So it would have been quite a traumatic start for those elephants, and um, it's interesting to see now how the behaviour seems to have changed. It, there was a long period where I'm told the elephants were more aggressive, and uh, that's, that's really something that we don't see so much of anymore, the elephants, but especially the younger ones are very comfortable with, with tourists. So there seems to have been a, a calming down effect. Um, but for anyone who knows the history of, of Akigera, you'll be familiar with the uh, the challenges that it's faced, uh, you know, with farming communities coming in there after the genocide, uh, and then a lot of poaching, a lot of snaring, and uh, we still see the, the wounds on the elephant uh, today from, from those snares, because really until that uh, joint venture between uh, African Parks and the Rwanda Development Board came together, um, that was the beginning of the removal of the snares, and that's made a huge, huge difference. And actually, if you go to the park today, you can go and do the behind the scenes visit there, and you can see all the snares that they've, they've removed over the years. So they've done a huge job actually cleaning up the park and making it, you know, habitable for for elephants. Um, so, so we know now that there are two plans in the park. One of them is is a bit smaller than the other. It tends to use the southern part of the park, and this is very generalised because they do go up to the north as well, but we, we tend to see them more in the south. Uh, that's uh, what we call Clan A, and the matriarch of that group we think is it's one female called Mokinkuru, who was in that uh, previous photograph that I, I just showed you, also used to be known as Floppy Ears. Um, 
And then we have Plan B, which is the larger of the two plans. They're largely seen in the north of the park, and that's, a, that's a roughly 55 to 60 elephants that, that we could be able to count. Um, we think that there may be several families, but again, it's very much a guess at this stage. We're still trying to, to find out, um, you know, simply by spending time with, with these elephants, uh, will the family break down? This? But it, it may be that that plan is made up of several families. Um, interestingly, Muka Kuru's family has a high level of tussiness. Um, so three of the females out of the nine in her family um, don't have tusks. And that's quite a high level of tusknessness um, by African standards. So we're still looking a bit closely at that to see whether that's the case across the population. But my, my sense at the stage is that it's, it's not. It just seems to be in that family. Um, we've identified 21 bulls so far. So um, that's an ongoing process. And there's still new bulls coming into the database all the time. Um, and, of course, we've seen several elephants with damaged trunks and feet um, from, uh, uh, from the damaged boost stairs. Okay, I'm just going to share with you this uh, short video. It's just a video that I made. It's very amateur, so apologies for that. But it was really just to uh, give people a bit of a background of the project and where the Akigara elephants have come from. So I'm going to press play and then sit back and enjoy. <laughs> Okay, 
So we, just to go back to what this project is all about, uh, our overall goal really is to understand and quantify the population behaviour of elephants in the park uh, with a focus on individuals and families. And the focus is on trying to, to find the pulling together information that is going to help conserve them. But we're also really keen on building local capacity to conserve elephants. So I'll talk some more about that in a minute. So that the local capacity building side is a big part of the project. So stage one in 2018 was really just to establish, you know, an idea of how many elephants there were. Um, and obviously the park has its own aerial censuses as, as well, so it's, it's linking into that. Uh, but I wanted to identify uh, as many individuals as possible and to get an idea of their ages and sexes in that first year. Um, and the next stage was to, once we have an idea of, of all the individuals, is to get a better sense of the family relationships between those individuals, whether it's a mother and calf relationship, it was, which, which families exist within the clans, um, who are the matriarchs, and what are the relationships between the clans as well, you know, how much crossover um, is there between the clans in the park. So this is a stage that was, we're really into at the moment and only have a little bit of information on. And the third part of this is building the local capacity to uh, conserve Akigera's elephants, and that's been largely uh, working in partnership with the Akigera Management Company and with the Akigera uh, Local Guides Co-op. Uh, and uh, they, they've been very much the citizen scientists on the ground collecting the data. When I'm not there, uh, I'm only there for a few weeks a year, so at the end of the day, it's up to the guides to be going out with tourists and being able to identify and uh, and share that data with our, with our WhatsApp growth group so we can continue to build the database. So how are we doing this? Well... We, we largely we're basing our methodology on the approach of the Anderselli Elephant Project in Kenya, which has I think about 50 years' experience of of uh, using this exact technique, uh, identifying elephants using ears and tusks and uh, noteworthy features, uh, whether it's a strange lump on the trunk or a, a scar on the rump or a, or a damaged foot or you know a trunk that might not be complete. Um, all of these things we can use to get to know the elephants. And uh, and one thing about elephants is that they do stay together, uh, the females stay together for life as families, so they form lifelong bonds. The males tend to leave, um, but the males are, are relatively, I find them fairly easy to identify in general because they do tend to have, have you know, tears in the ears and quite distinct tusks as well. And there's big size differences in the males because the males keep growing for their entire lives. So um, the approach has been to use that information and to develop the Akigera Elephant Identification Database, and uh, that's what we've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, so far, we've got about 70 elephants in the database. Um, the first year, we collected 40, and the second year, another 30. It's getting increasingly harder to get more elephants because, um, obviously, we, you know, there's, there's only about 100 to 120 in the park, so... Um, we're picking up new ones all the time, and there's obviously new calves coming along all the time. Um, we we held a couple of workshops uh, when I was there in December 2019, and the focus of those, this was for Akigera guides, the local guides and their staff, the focus of these was to really let people know about the project and encourage them to get involved. And I, on the ground there, um, my right-hand man is uh, Godfrey Nyamirangra, who is basically heads up the project uh, on the ground and helps coordinate the guides and, and continually encourages them to, uh, you know, get involved and learn more of the elephants. So so the workshops were really effective in getting interest from the guides. Uh, a number of them became much more interested and then we're going out into the park immediately after those workshops and then feeding back on the WhatsApp group uh, about new sightings and asking, you know, is this so-and-so elephant or is this so-and-so elephant? Is this a new one? And so we've, what we're doing now is trying to get them all more familiar with using the database when they're out in the field. And they can access the database online or offline. It's, uh, it's available on their phones as well. So, uh, you know, it's something they could have out when they're out with tourists anytime and be accessing and checking up, you know, when they see an elephant herd um, and looking at it and working out who's who um, in the zoo. So the other thing we've done is is, is try and, uh, through the guides themselves, is is ask them to give the 
elephants that we've identified so far, especially the distinctive looking ones, Kenya and Wanda names. So that's the process we're in now. A number of them do have um, names now. So that's helping them also to remember those individuals. Um, and what we're hoping to do is create a better sense of ownership as well around the project through that, um, through that process. Um, we also, I was lucky to have a University of Rwanda student. Thanks, uh, Beth, for helping arrange that. Uh, Diane came and joined me for about a week uh, in December 2019, and we spent a lot of time out in the field also looking, looking for the elephants and uh, going through this process of learning how to identify elephants in the field. So there is a, there is a real technique to it, and you have to, I, get, I suppose, get your eye in, in terms of what you're looking for. And the best way to do that is to go out into the field and, and do it yourself and then take photographs and then come back to the computer and compare the, your photographs to the ones in the database. So as I said, we have a WhatsApp group and the great thing about the world today is that we all connected and the, uh, the WhatsApp group is constantly being updated. Whenever any of the local guards are in the park, uh, if they find an elephant, they, they let us know on that uh, WhatsApp group and uh, they have a go at identifying uh, the elephants that they're seeing letting us know whether it's Clan A or Clan B. So we're also getting a good idea from that anecdotal data about which part of the park uh, the, the two clans are using at different times of the year. So that's been really interesting to, to get a sense of that. And of course, the more that the local guides are using it, uh, the, the more they're getting into it and the more of an interactive experience they can give their fiery guests as well. So what I hope is that this will give them a whole other level of experience they can offer tourists that are coming to the park because of the extreme knowledge they're going to have of these individual elephants in the park. So this is what the database looks like. We have a page like this for each elephant. Uh, we have a, a name, uh, usually a Kenya Rwanda name, uh, that means something to the local guides. Um, the code represents, the first letter represents clan A or clan B, and then the second letter represents the family group within that clan. We've done that at this stage because we don't know how many families are within the clans. So we really are in the early stages of developing that. And then there's a number for that particular elephant. So, so each elephant has a distinctive code. Um, we, we have an assessment of the, the age, whether it's an adult or a, a sub-adult or a calf or, or whatever. Um, and then we have a description of the, the tusks, the ears, both the left and the right side and any other distinguishing features on that animal that might help us identify it in future. Um, what we try to get is front, front photographs so that we can see the ears out. And that's always an interesting challenge, but that's been a big part of going out with, with my groups, uh, my safari groups as well, because many of them have, have really good cameras as well, so they're able to take good photographs of the ears out. Um, and some of those photographs have gone into the database. And also some of the local guides, um, uh, Herman is one who has excellent photographs from, from his camera um, showing those those holes. So when you can zoom in, you can actually see you know, individual holes that can help you identify. Well, this is just a photograph of the, the workshop that was held in December 2019. And there's Godfrey there who was helping me. I, I think um, I think we've got some people from Akagera that are probably watching this now. I saw JP's name come up. He's in the picture there as well. So um, it was really great to get that engagement and uh, really as a starting point to learn about, you know, what the guides were interested in and how they could, um, could use this information as well to become um, better guides. So we got, we've had some great feedback on the WhatsApp group about uh, how the guides feel about the project and uh, it's, it's been really, really a positive thing. Obviously this year it's been very difficult because, the, because of COVID, many of the guides are not able to get into the park so we're not getting out there. So we're really hoping that that's going to pick up, uh, you know, this year. And if not this year, then we'll really get, get things going again next year. And I do have some funding to run um, uh, some field guard training uh, with, with the Akagera guards, which hopefully we'll do later this year um, if COVID allows. But I think the more, the more um, experience that the guides get on the ground and going out uh, with myself and with God for it and really learning about, you know, He's seeing the animal out in the field uh, and seeing it for yourself and then comparing it to the database, it suddenly all makes sense uh, when you're out there. So this project really is, a, is a very much a combination of, of uh, the technology, uh, the tourism and, and the field techniques all working together. And this is uh, a photograph of, uh, of uh, Diane, uh, the uh, student that, from the University of Rwanda that joined me uh, last year, who also went, went through this process of learning how to identify elephants through using the Amboseli technique. 
Um, this is uh, Clan A here and fam the first family, uh, Mukukuru's group. And you can see she's right at the front there with her ears flopped forward, very easy to recognise. And you can see quite a few tuskless females in this group too. Um, what we think at this stage is that there's not a lot of overlap between the two clans. And um, that's, that's quite interesting because they do both use the middle of the park, but it seems like the, the, the Clan A uses more of the southern end and Clan B uses more of the northern end. Um, but Drew Bantlin from the park has, has been has now got our satellite collars on uh, a few females, so we're, we're going to be really interested to see what the results of those um, home range analyses are. So that will give us a better idea about that in the future, hopefully. But I wanted to just introduce you to a few of these elephants while I've still got time. Um, this particular female, well, she was a she's been the most interesting one of all. She's she's basically the cover girl for the big Akigera poster when you come into the park. For a long time, uh, we thought this was a male elephant because frequently we would find her on her own, and that's very unusual for, for a female. Um, and she, she was also the first elephant that I ever met, and she charged. Uh, she was very aggressive, and she's a very big female, and she's a very round head. And generally, the, the male elephants are the ones with the round head, and the females tend to have a square head. So uh, while this female was on her own and uh, so aggressive, and had a roundish head, we thought this was this was a bull. And it was only in the second field season that we realised that actually this was a female. Um, and we realised that because we started to see from our, uh, our field observations that she was, wasn't alone. She was often with another um, young elephant, which we thought was also a bull because it was on its own. Uh, but it turns out that this other elephant was also a female. And the other, this other female is, has many wounds. Um, that's uh, Marinzi there as well, the same female. And this is the other elephant that she uh, hangs out with all the time. And so we've called this one Survivor for obvious reasons. It's an elephant that's had a very hard time in its life. Uh, three of its legs have severe snare wounds. One of them is, is, is very bad. Uh, somehow she's survived with half a trunk and, and she really hobbles along. She, she has a hard time walking, but she manages to eat. And I, I could never understand how she could have survived for so long. But uh, Jess Brenner, when I first arrived in the park, he said, no, she's been around for several years. And, and uh, so, you know, she, we're just letting her go. And um, interestingly, it turns out that, that Survivor and Marinzi are always together. And this is something we've learned just by being out in the park and observing. And uh, what we thought was two bulls was actually two females and we're guessing, of course, but this may be the mother and daughter. And they tend to trail Clan A, but they're not always with Clan A, but they're not very far away from them. Um, but Marinzi is extremely protective of Survivor, and perhaps the reason why we got charged frequently in the early days is because Survivor was somewhere nearby and uh, we just couldn't see her or we didn't realise the relationship between the two. But usually we, when we see them now, because we know the relationship, you'll see... Marinzi and Survivor will be next to each other and Marinzi will block the road to allow Survivor the time to get across the road uh, and it's slow because of her, her, um, her wounds. Um, but it's, it's actually a really beautiful relationship. So that's been a, an interesting observation that's come through just being out in the field. So we're looking forward to uh, learning more about these two. Um, this is a bull that we called Mandela in the early stages. He was a, a very peaceful old bull. Uh, he, he's got distinctive tusks and ears, but he's also got this big uh, protrusion on his leg, which makes him very easy to recognise. He doesn't have a satellite collar anymore, uh, so that's something that we can't use to identify him anymore, but he's he's known as Bull B in the database. Um, at this stage, the bulls all have a litter of the alphabet to identify them. And this is Mandela here, Bull B again. You can see in the ears, uh, there's really distinctive tears that you can use once you get these close-up photographs. Um, you can use these tears, and you can also use the way the tusks uh, are aligned, um, uh, the shape and the angle and the curve, and um, some bulls have extremely long, skinny uh, tusks, some bulls have short, some don't have any at all, some have them cut off, so each bull is quite distinctive in terms of the tusks. Um, I'll just go past that one. Uh, so this is Plan B, the larger of the two, and you can't see all of it here, but um, you can imagine what it's like trying to identify elephants when you have 50 or 60 elephants all together like this. Uh, so Plan B has been more challenging for us to identify. 
and there's, a, there's also a lot of young ones in this um, in this group, so we're still working on identifying all of them. Um, um, this is one of the females in Plan B, and you just tend to see certain similarities with the, a number of the elephants in Plan B have these tufts that are almost like daggers that point straight down. Um, and uh, the, I wonder if that's an inherited uh, trait because this one here, which I, I just affectionately call dagger tusks, uh, she really has very distinctive tusks that go straight down and are very um, pointed at the ends. And she has you know, eyes, she has these wrinkles that go straight up above her eyes as well. Um, you can also see in her ears there's certain holes and, and tears that we can use to identify her. But um, a number, number of them have, uh, have that characteristic. So uh, there is some work being done by Drew Bantlin uh, in the park on the genetics of these elephants because they are... Well, on the western side of Rwanda, you have the forest elephants, and on the eastern side, you have what we think are, we assume are savannah elephants. But um, I'm curious to know whether these, there may be some uh, hybridization in this particular elephant population uh, because they're obviously very close to Tanzania's elephants, um, but also quite close to the forest elephants as well. So there may be a zone of overlap there. Uh, this one is called Old Camoso. She's in Plan B. She's she always an elephant that's quite close to the front. I think she's a, probably one of the matriarchs in this group, uh, one of the older things. She, she's called uh, Old Komoso because she has tusks that go off to the left, um, and she's got a very distinctive uh, big, big tear in her um, left ear, which we use to identify her as well. So... Um, and this old female is uh, one of the special ones. I think she may be one of the original elephants left over from the, the reintroduction in 1975. Um, she's known as Mashami, uh, which I'm told in Kenya Rwanda means branches, and that's because of the, the many branches in her family tree that, that uh, she's, she's led to. Um, and interesting that she has these, these, um, these high, not, they're not eyebrows, but sort of wrinkles above her eye um, that a number in that clan have as well. Um, she, she's uh, a bit of a war veteran, this old lady. She's been through a lot. She's survived a lot of the snaring and uh, the years of poaching uh, and uh, been through the, the genocide in, in those years as well. She's got a, a big hole in one ear that looks like a bullet hole. I don't know if that's actually what it is, but, um, but her ears also have a tendency to flop a bit forward in the same way that um, Mokukuru's ears do. And she also has a very distinctive trunk uh, towards the tip. She has this hole, uh, which uh, I don't know what that was caused by, but possibly a, a snare as well. And it's not unusual for the elephants in Akagera to have the tips of their trunks missing. Um, I would say there's at least probably about 10 that I've seen um, that have that sort of damage uh, from snares. Um, but they're getting on with, with living. Um, even with a half a trunk, that's all the survivor. Uh, you know, she's still managing to go on with a bit of protection from Lorenzi. So, as I said, this is all very preliminary results and um, we've got grand plans, but at the moment we, we are kind of, uh, relying heavily on the guides to get into the park with tourists. So, you know, we're just hoping that tourists do come back to the park and, and continue to support the local guides, get them out there so they can keep collecting data. Um, obviously, I'll be back there with my safari groups as, as soon as possible. And um, I should probably mention as well that this project is funded largely by my safari groups. So they are the ones that, uh, by coming, they pay to go and experience the, the, the um, uh, being on safari, but actually contributing. So they're taking photographs and being out there on the research project as well. So um, that's a big part of it. We've also been had, had a couple of other sponsors, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, but we want to keep collecting this baseline data because we really there's so many more elephants we need to identify and we, we're just at the beginning of understanding some of the family relationships and who the matriarchs are as well. Um, as I mentioned, very keen to do the field-based training course for the freelance guides. Uh, I hope that will be in December this year, uh, but all dependent on, on COVID. And Godfrey and I will do that together in two different vehicles and um, Hopefully, get people out there actually learning and seeing for themselves the different uh, elephants in the different groups. Um, and, and um, you know, what we're trying to do at all times is to contribute to conservation wherever possible. So we're always looking for ways that we can assist park management and, and um, deliver information that's going to be useful uh, to them. 
So um, just finally to thank as well um, the Wilderness uh, uh, Trust who have sponsored my previous elephant work in Namibia and are con contributing to this work in, in Akagera as well. Um, the the Akagera Freelance Guides and um, Akagera uh, Management Company uh, are our big supporters on the ground. And, um, and finally to acknowledge as well, again, I had mentioned Godfrey a few times here, he's uh, measuring a, um, a hind foot of a bull. One of the other things we do is uh, we, we try and measure the hind feet of elephants through their footprints. And there's an, uh, an equation that you can use based on the Akigera, sorry, the Amboseli work, which will allow you to estimate the animal's age from its, its footprint. Um, so Godfrey's there measuring that up so we can try and get an estimate of the particular bull's age. Um, I won't mention all of these folks, but I just wanted to, did want to mention them because they're, they're so important to making sure that this project uh, continues. And here's some of the safari groups. Uh, and uh, these are the people that want to get out there and, and help. And they've also become very important sponsors of the project by connecting to the project. They feel very much um, part of it and they want to continue to support uh, people and they've also continued, they've actually supported the guides um, uh, personally during some of these hard times uh, with, some, with some food supplies as well during the, the COVID pandemic. So, uh, you know, it's amazing the difference you can make. Tourism can work together with conservation. It can be very, very effective. I think we're seeing that on a lot of different levels at Akigera. Okay, so that's it from me. I'll zoom out here. Um, Thank you so much, Tammy. Uh, that was so interesting and uh, really inspiring. I, I want to invite people to ask questions uh, or to Tammy. You can either unmute and ask or you're welcome to post your questions in the chat. So um, I'm going to start with some questions that are posted here. Um, I see Dale Tuisingizi has already posted. So he has a question, do elephants cross to Tanzania? And if so, what about their safety? Do you recognize whether sometimes they're back to the park or not after traveling to Tanzania? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I don't think so. Um, but I guess it is cool. uh, the, uh, It's a question I asked as well in the early days. Uh, they, I think the radio, the, the slight blurring data will give us a better idea of that. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the bulls were moving further afield, but I think the, the female groups are probably staying in the safety of the park at this stage. Um, mm. I'm not sure it's entirely safe on the Tanzania side, um, but it would be interesting to see at some point in the future whether, uh, you know, there could be greater opportunities for transfrontier conservation areas between Akagera and uh, the Tanzania side. Uh, that would be something really interesting to, to potentially you know, increase the you know, habitat available to elephants in the park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting question. Then he, another question, do you know why Mukachuru's family has few individuals compared to Mashami's family? Yeah, I probably should add to that as well that there is a second family that's linked to um, her family. Um, and we, we really have struggled to find them. We, we've been calling them a mystery herd, but there's probably about 20 animals in that group as well. Um, we just need more time on the ground to, to actually find them, but we have had glimpses of them as they disappear into the bush. Um, so I, I, I don't know why that, that, that's a smaller group. Um, you know, I suppose it could be related to habitat as well. But it, from what I understand, previously it was just one big herd in the park and they've recently split into the two different clans. We're calling them clans because we think they potentially will break up into to further families as well. So um, I, I, I'd have to, I'd, I'd be completely speculating at the moment. That's an interesting question to think about. Hmm. All right. And then um, he has another question. Um, I could see that you managed to identify individuals. Do you have any plans for paternity studies? Uh, not, not at this stage, um, but it, it, that's that's. I think the next stage is to get a bit of a, a better idea of who who the mothers are, who are the offspring, um, and uh, and I, I think at this stage we're in such early days of the project. We're really just trying to work out who's who within the families, um, and I think to get a really to have a good sense of paternity, you're looking at DNA studies. So that may be a question for the research um, 
director in the park, Drew, Drew Batman, he's, he's trying to get um, genetic samples analysed. So they may come out of the genetic data that he's looking you know, for the future. Hmm. All right, and then there's another question from Adrian. He's asking, um, are the Irinaches on the elephants natural or human-made to differentiate them uh, as, as done for rhinos? Yeah, good question. They're, abs they're absolutely natural. Um, they, they, these are just um, tears that they pick up by walking through the ship or perhaps through fights or, um, you know, you know, it's not uncommon for an elephant to lose a, a bit of its tail from a, a hyena or something when it's young. Um, so, so these are natural as far as we know, but obviously the snares are not natural. Um, but yeah, it's very different to the, the rhino notching that's done by, by people. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, so we're relying on the natural uh, traits of these elephants. But what's interesting as well is that it changes all the time as well because the, you, know, you come back after a year and you see that there's new new tears where there wasn't before. So you've got to really stay on top of it. It's really the value of this long-term on-ground research. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. So when you come back, there'll be a lot of differences, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so there's another question here about the survival and mortality rates of the elephants, if you are seeing any impacts of climate change. No, I think we haven't been going for long enough, to be honest. Um, two years is a pretty short time in an elephant's life, and they live for 60 years or so. Um, so, I mean, that's something that could be looked at absolutely in the future. And and I think really, you've got to remember as well that this is the time these elephants have been studied uh, in their detail. So it's absolute baseline studies at the moment, It's it's uh, and the park itself is also doing that, those sort of baseline assessments of population doing the aerial surveys um so the focus at the moment is just on you know that, that, that basic information for management but down the track it would be interesting to see whether we're starting to see some impacts of, of climate change on, on these species um we are be interested to learn more about that mm. uh all right those were the questions so far in the chat does anybody else have any other questions to ask tammy Um, I, oh, there's a question here from um, Dr. Gessingirwa. What is the tusklessness due to? What, what, what causes the animals to not have a tusk? Yeah, well, it seems to be a natural process. Um, what I can't work out is why one family seems to have a very high level of tusklessness compared to others in the park. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, it, 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 perhaps to some extent it is inherent. Um, there's, there's a national park in Mozambique, Gorondosa, where this has been studied in a lot more detail, and they're finding because of long term um, that that tusklessness is being favoured uh, through, it's, it's not really evolution, but it's something that we've brought on through, that, that, that it's being inherited. Um, more tusklessness elephants are. Uh, are being born and inheriting that trait, um, but I don't. I don't think it's going to be a big issue in Akagera because most of them do, um, do have tusks. Um, I know it was an elephant, a bull in the early days that did have his tusks. away now that they did have his tusks were basically removed because he was considered a problem animal, uh, and he was hand raised in the early days when they were all young. Um, but but the the, the tusks in that particular family, I, I don't know what caused it, but it's it's adults and it's also some of the young ones as well. So mm -hmm. there's something going on there that perhaps is um, uh, quite a dominant um, trait mm -hmm. in one of those females. All right, thank you. Um, I have a question. When you mentioned how um, through your tour company, um, you're able you know, through your clients, you are able to, you were able to assist uh, community members during the pandemic, during the very difficult time when people, um, you know, their salaries went down or went to zero and where they had difficulty getting food, for example. Um, it made me think that um, it's a bit of an issue of scale that maybe the smaller scale tourism uh, companies that are more 
uh, operating more personally, have the opportunity to continue supporting conservation even in times like a pandemic, because there's been a lot of criticism of prism that you know it cannot it can't continue to support conservation during a time like a pandemic because people aren't visiting the parks. But what you showed today was that there is the possibility to do that at a small scale when the company uh, you know works at a very personal level and uh, makes those kind of connections with the park and with the people. So I was wondering if you could tell us your thoughts on that. Yeah, and, and I think it's possible. We have actually seen it very successfully. You know, in a place like Botswana, um, there's a company there called Natural Selection. Um, they've been very active in doing food drops to um, entire communities, uh, even though they have no income through tourism. They're a premium and uh, safari company, similar to Wilderness Safaris, who have also been doing this sort of work during the pandemic. Um, and uh, governors perhaps have done it, I believe, and Azilia, Africa, in Tanzania and Kenya. So they're quite big companies and, um, you know, reaching out to the US who have been to these places and have felt the magic of Africa and have, have personal connections with the guides. You know, people really, once you get a safari, you, you want to give something back. You don't, you, you don't want to just, you never forget about it, you know. But for me, my company is quite small. Um, but the people that, that come on my safaris are uh, ethically minded and they, they come in with the conservationists. So they're not, they're not going on a safari that's just a tourist experience. They, they're really going to hear about you know, the behind the scenes of how conservation works while they're with me. So it is interesting. I think you can do it at, at both scales. And for us, it's been particular uh, clients, um, a number of them in Singapore in particular, who've been very generous and have, have basically said, uh, you know, I, I, I support this elephant world, I support these guides, I know these people personally, I respect them, and, and it's not fair that this is happening to them. So, you know, Akigera National Park is able to continue to pay its, its uh, staff. Uh, the Akigera local guides lost all their income because it's totally dependent on tourists coming to the park. So that was just one way that I thought that we could immediately help for, for about three or four months there um, just to get over that initial hump um, of difficulty. If it's a small thing, but um, yeah, absolutely, the connections that you make through safaris it can be very, very powerful. And um, you know, even one of our safari guests is going to be is sponsoring the uh, the guide uh, field training that I'll be doing in a year's time. Um, so again, you know, you reach out to these people and uh, they see it, and it, it can be life changing for them, but it can also result in some positive action on the ground. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Uh, there's another question, one more question here in the chat. Um, what do you think about the reintroduction of the elephants into other parks in Rwanda, for example, Nyingwe National Park? This is a question for me, Jet. I don't know if that's been proposed. I'm, I'm perhaps a bit out of the loop on, on that. Um, but I know, you know, forest elephants are the ones that have been so badly affected by poaching. I think two-thirds of the forest elephant population was lost over a 10-year period up to when the great elephant census happened. Um, so we really need to make great efforts to build up that population. Uh, but we have to be very careful as well because, it, you know, the forest elephants and the savannah elephants have different genetics. So, uh, and we have to, whenever you uh, are building up a population or translocating, it's so important to ensure that the factors that affected their decline in the first place are not still there. So. Have we created an environment that is, is safe for those animals, has a large continuous habitat, um, and, and that has enough uh, sustainable income and jobs being created through tourism or otherwise, uh, that there's not going to be a problem with poaching. So all those factors have to be brought in. But um, it will be great to see elephant numbers uh, grow, absolutely, in both on both sides of the um, of Rwanda. I, I personally haven't seen forest elephants. Uh, I have every time I've been to the gorillas, uh, I've seen lots of dung, but still not seen a forest elephant. So I'm hoping next time but might be my, my turn. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, and then uh, and there, now there's one other question. Um, looking at the size of the park and the rate of population growth of elephants, will there be a problem um, uh, if the population 
uh, does continue growing, for example, um, and affecting the ecosystem and possibly requiring culling? Yeah, I don't, I don't think culling is on the agenda anytime soon. Um, and I don't really think culling is, is justified anymore. Um, one of the great things African Parks did in partnership with Rwanda government was they put a, a big electric fence that separated the park from the communities. Um, and, and that immediately removed the human elephant conflict problems that were, were happening. Um, at the moment, the population is growing steadily and um, at, a, at, a, at a normal rate, and, and that's great. Um, I think in the future, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if the population does continue to grow, what possibilities there are for, for transfrontier conservation areas, similar to what's been done in Southern Africa with the, um, the, uh, the uh, transfrontier conservation area that covers five Southern African countries. Where elephants can freely remo move around those countries um, in and out, and they're all managed cooperatively um, for trees and African conservation. So that, maybe that's something to think about for the future. Yeah, good. that's interesting. Um, all right. Ah, again, another question popped in here. Maybe we'll do this one and then we'll um, close up. We like to keep to the time limit. So this other question, this last question, how, um, let's see, how can elephants impact the natural environment they live in? How can they negatively impact the natural environment that they live in? Well, obviously, if you have, and thanks for that question, I see that was from JP. Um, if you have lots and lots of elephants in an area, they, they can eat themselves out of house and home. And um, that's a situation that you, you obviously want to avoid. Um, that, that tends not to be the situation for elephants in most places, unfortunately. It's the opposite. Um, it's because of the issues with poaching um, and habitat loss, it's, it's going the other way. Uh, but yeah, elephants can 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 be very destructive, and um, obviously they they are a keystone species. And moving through the environment, they they're knocking down trees all the time and eat a huge amount, um, eating all day and all night. Uh, and so they they can do a lot of damage in an area if there's a lot of them. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's not an issue that's going to be something to worry about in Akagera for for quite some time. And I think you know they have a really competent management team in Akagera. And I'd be very confident that they'll be watching that situation and, uh, and you know, being really on top of the, the, the very best science and the best uh, conservation management to, to make sure that the that, that, uh, Akira's elephant population grows in a sustainable way. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We had a great turnout this morning, and I uh, hope you have a good evening and it cools off, Tammy. And we'll stay in touch. We look forward to hearing um, updates from your study as you progress. Yeah, thank you. Very thank much. you. And stay safe, everybody. Bye for now.